hours after exposure to the blood of a symptomatic colleague, I found myself making my way up the stairs to this room. And I am not alone. Everyone who's infected, we've all come up here wanting to get outside. I know full well I mustn't leave, given the possibility I'm infected. Yet, I can't contain this urge I feel inside me, like the alcoholic who tries to make any excuse for one more drink. Every step I took up those stairs filled me with this sense of bliss. I still have all my wits about me. It took no time at all to rewire the electronic lock and open the emergency exit. Then, just as I was about to set foot outside, I finally realized what was going on. This desire for freedom is not my own, but that of the vocal cord parasites inside me. They want the ravens to feed on us, pecking us to death, attracted by these sweet secretions. They have mutated to facilitate this. The sweet smell is powerful enough to attract even a species with such a weak nose. So, before the parasites take complete control, I must. Most of the staff in here are already infected. At least, everyone I've looked at is. Infection with this parasite causes a high fever in the pharynx. I have modified a pair of night vision goggles to react only to this temperature range. Approaching. With these goggles, you can identify who is infected. Other infected will, like me, feel compelled to make it outside. If the ravens get their meal, they'll head for land next. That cannot be allowed to happen. The whole idea of the vocal cord parasites was that they'd only copulate once exposed to a specific language over time. But the parasites infecting our men in the laboratory laid their eggs straight away. The larvae were eating their lung tissue almost immediately. What kind of mutation was it? Those who were infected and cured still carried the vocal cord parasites in their throats. They were still there, but the males had been rendered female by the Volbachia, and copulation could not occur, so we thought. But it is the Volbachia that mutated, not the parasites. You remember I told you the Volbachia attempts to maximize its number of female infected hosts? Yes, hence the male-to-female transformation. Precisely. But other Volbachia strains use different methods. Cytoplasmic incompatibility, killing the males, and parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis? Aphids? Aphids use that to reproduce via females only. Very good. The females lay their eggs without a male present, creating clones of themselves in explosive numbers. Parthenogenesis was originally a means for an organism to take maximum advantage of abundant resources by increasing its numbers. Certain strains of Obakia forced this to occur, to create more and more infected females. And that's why our men develop symptoms in the blink of an eye. Wolbachia, causing parthenogenesis, is common in parasitic wasps. Of course, the Wolbachia I introduced to your men did not have this characteristic. But I believe the mutation, whatever it was, caused it to force parthenogenesis in its host, the vocal cord parasites. 
The Volpakia we used to prevent egg lane became the agent of limitless reproduction. There's something else. The symptomatic infected in the laboratory all wanted to get outside, even knowing there was napalm waiting for them out there. You said the parasites made them act that way, but parasites controlling humans. Is it possible? Parasites altering the host's behavior is a common occurrence in the world of nature. Long ago, the vocal cord parasites had this ability. But even I never foresaw they might control humans. Until I heard the things your man said. You mean the researcher on the top floor? The bit about, I'm not a snail? Yes. Among parasitic worms, there is a genus called Leucochloridium that uses snails as intermediary hosts. As you know, snails prefer dark, gloomy environments. But once parasitized by Leucochloridium, they desire to be in the light. And that is not all. The parasitic worms thrust themselves into the snail's antennae, making them swell to abnormal size. The snail, meanwhile, frantically wiggles its antennae as the parasites squirm inside. The swollen, wriggling antennae soon resemble caterpillars. I don't get it. It is so they can be eaten by birds. Leucochloridium needs a bird as its definitive host to breed. They require their snail host to be snapped up by a predator. So they make the humble snail appear to be a delicious caterpillar and lead it to somewhere in open sight. So you mean the staff trying to get outside was so the birds could pick at them. The parasites altered their mental state making them crave higher places and to be outdoors. I can only surmise that both the Volbachia and the parasites mutated before the ancestors of the vocal cord parasites infected humans. Their hosts were birds. What we saw in the laboratory was some throwback to that time. The parasites attempting to make birds their intermediary hosts sounds insane. A prey mantis that is host to a parasitic hair worm will dive into water and drown itself. Just so the hair worm can lay its eggs in water. Rats infected with Toxoplasma gondii lose their instinctive caution and run right up to cats. Just some of the many ways parasites control the host. But we're humans. Surely our minds are too complex for that. I thought just the same. Free will is what makes us human, so it never occurred to me that the parasites could be controlling the symptomatic. But the mood, the will of a person can be easily affected by the balance of their cerebral substances. Take the toxoplasma I mentioned. It does infect humans, and it is thought the infected develop a more reckless attitude. Ugh. But to think that mutations occurred in both the Walbachia and its parasite hosts... Your observation is most apt. Both mutations occurring at once indicates the presence of a powerful mutagen. I see. Keep working on narrowing down what it was. I want to thank you, Code Talker. Your pinpointing the cause of the vocal cord parasites mutation enabled us to purge an enemy from Mother Base. You mean that scientist? Yeah, I was convinced he betrayed us, but I was wrong. He was never on our side to begin with, so ultimately there was no traitor among us. And yet I made everyone distrustful with my talk of spies, the end result being men turning on each other in the laboratory. You must not blame yourself. They were all infected with a mutated strain. The outcome would have been the same. You know, we defeated Skullface, but it didn't lessen our pain. It's a pain we'll never be rid of. I see that now, but I thought I could burn it away. In the end, all I burned was our own men. 
infectious diseases, parasites. Without such foreign enemies, the immune system will start attacking the body, developing allergies and autoimmune diseases. The same is true of organizations. You're right, but I do not deserve to rebuke you. My desire to retaliate against the English language is what attracted me to the vocal cord parasites in the first place. Had it not been for that, I would never have been used by Skullface. We both allowed revenge to crawl into our minds and lay its eggs. Sahelanthropus will unleash that thirst onto the future. How long are we going to be tormented by what he left behind? There is no choice but to live with that pain. Be symbiotic with our vengeful nature. Whatever we do, we must not allow that thirst for revenge to control us. I hope you bought a better hamburger this time, Kazuhira. Right. Well, the last one was lacking in every way. The patty was too thin, the bun too dry. And the lettuce. Days old at best. <laughs> hey, that was a hundred percent all beef patty, and no shortening in the bun either. Mm. Nature's blessings. Unadulterated, in hamburger form. Is that it? But when taste falls short, so does our gratitude to nature. Making such precious blessings unpalatable is sacrilege. I... I hate to admit it, but... I think you're right. I should have known better than to settle for second best. That's why I had him run some more R&D, develop a new burger. In fact, one of our researchers just dropped by with the latest results. Here it is. See how you like... this. We shall see indeed. I thank you for this bounty, Mother Earth. So? What's the verdict? Hmm... Not bad. Ah... Uh, and? But it does not hold a candle to what I ate back home. Uh, everyone's a critic. <sighs> Damn it. I'm sure the Kobe beef... But maybe we didn't have enough. <laughs> we had any more. We're cutting into our profits. Profits? We'll be taking a loss on every unit. Mm, what are you talking about? Huh? Oh, uh... Anyway, I'll be back with another round of product. I will be waiting. Did you say... product? Oh. Feeling hungry, old-timer? Hmm. <sighs> Old timer. I do not get hungry, no. But you have a new hamburger? Uh, you guessed it. And this time we use lamb. Lamb? Uh, you, you're not a lamb kind of guy? A hamburger is made of beef. Whoever heard of a hamburger without beef? Yeah, but we gotta stay fresh, stand out from our competition. You're what? Just give it a try. If you say so. Not bad. But... But I cannot call this a hamburger. I thought we were onto something this time. Maybe the problem is that it looks like a regular hamburger. Gotta think outside the box. Too much baggage if they come in expecting just another burger. Let's see, cotton candy? To make it look like a sheep? <laughs> yeah. Just a minute. You really think people would eat that? What is it you are planning? Are you using me? A taste tester. A one-man focus group? Well, actually, I've already started. I got a place called, uh, Miller's Maxi Buns. 
You are kidding me. Well, to be honest, business hasn't been great. No one seems to like my, uh, buns. The ocelot said Diamond Dog's budget did not add up. But... You don't mean to tell me. What? No, no, no. Our, our black budget's got it all covered. I'm not embezzling GMP or anything. Still, uh, let's not say anything to Snake, okay? Very well. However, Kazuhira, it takes more than premium ingredients and a clever recipe to satisfy the palate. Okay, so what do we do? The palate seeks one thing. Chemical additives. Chemical additives. There is nothing mysterious or spiritual about good flavor. The tongue simply identifies specific amino acids, which the brain then recognizes as appealing. Therefore, all that is needed is to chemically isolate those amino acids and incorporate them into your products. To be clear, I speak of flavor. The rest is irrelevant. That seems a little extreme. Do not forget that I am a scientist after all. And using science for the benefit of others is a joy. In seeking coexistence with nature's blessings, not everything can remain in its natural form. When we fall ill, we must be treated. Otherwise, that very nature could cost us our lives. Agriculture is one of nature's many blessings. But through that process, we damage the surrounding vegetation. Yeah. Whether it's a massive farm or a tiny field, we always leave our mark on the land. The same is true of parasites. And for food preparation. If tapeworms in the raw meat of another animal enter the human body, they roam around trying to find their usual habitat. Sometimes even eating away at the brain in their confusion. So in looking through a scientific point of view, you see the necessity for processing food. Yes, it is also sometimes necessary to eliminate certain parasites, or selectively use or even modify others. Alternatively, we could say that if a man is part of nature, the work he does is also part of it. What is important is the balance. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, old timer. You really opened my eyes. <sighs> I fooled myself into thinking people today wanted high-quality, all-natural goods. But my favorite burgers were never about that. What they want is something like the first burger I had in America when I went to meet my dad. A Frankenburger loaded with additives. That's the America I knew and loved. I'll be back in a jiffy, old-timer. My next burger's gonna knock your socks off. Kazuhira, wait. What is important is how we balance the... Uh... Quick for a one-legged man, Frankenberger. What kind of a dive did your old man take you to? Rise and shine, old-timer. It is complete. I had our best and brightest working overtime, fine-tuning the greatest burger the world has ever known. I call it the Chemical Burger. What on earth is that color? Now, now, don't judge a burger by its color. Go on, try it. I am... not very hungry. What? Oh, I get it. Now, sure, it's loaded with additives, but each one's been approved by the WHO for human consumption. Come on, one little bite's not gonna kill you. Are you sure of that? Hmm... Fine. <laughs> Well, what do you think? It's... 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 It is perfect. Right? Right? This takes me back to the taste of my youth. The neon signs on the 
Mother Road. Oh, I can see them now. So, what do you think of our science now? And it doesn't just taste great. You won't believe how cheap it is to make. And because it's pumped up with preservatives, it won't spoil easily in regions lacking refrigerated storage or transportation infrastructure. This bad boy could even solve Africa's hunger problem. Excuse me. People will no longer fight over food or find reason to hate one another. Mankind will come together, reunited between these fluffy buns. Forget Pax Americana. Say hello to Pax Hamburgana. Pax Hamburgana. Skullface thought that destruction was the way to free the peoples of the world from American imperialism. But this is different. Tackling something head-on just makes for more conflict. Only by uniting the world can its various inhabitants truly become free. Having lived as an American parasite as long as I have, I know what I'm talking about. The Chemical Burger is poised to be the greatest liberating force the world has ever known. An ethnic liberator. Burger. Now all I need is a better brand image, starting with a name. I gotta run, old timer. I'll catch you later. Das war's auch schon von dieser Kassettenepisode. Eine steht euch bevor. Oha. Also ich muss sagen, äh, ein paar Informationen aus den Kassettenepisoden waren durchaus hilfreich. Ja. Wenigstens hilfreich für, ich habe ja immer, finde ich eigentlich sogar noch ein bisschen mehr Verständnisschwierigkeiten bei äh, Metal Gear manchmal. Ein paar äh, aufschlussreiche Sachen waren auf jeden Fall dabei. Und man muss ja jetzt auch noch sagen, die spannendsten oder für mich spannendsten Informationen kommen auch erst in der nächsten Episode. Denn da geht es darum, was eigentlich nach dem Hauptspiel so passiert ist. Und das hört ihr dann in der nächsten Episode. Und von daher verabschieden wir uns und sagen dann bis zum nächsten Mal. Tschüss. Macht's gut.